Okay, that's good. Brilliant. Right, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to our second uh, lecture of this series, of this, this autumn series. Um, this evening, we have um, Andy Mitten from Keel University, who Graham's going to introduce in a few minutes. Uh, I don't have any sort of housekeeping things to to announce at the moment, other than our next lecture is on Wednesday the 11th, um, 7 o'clock again, uh, from Alistair Murphy from the University of St Andrews, and he's going to be talking about Cleveland's Mathematics Past. But today, I think we shall hand over to Graham and then over to Andy to talk about uh, the Delta Tops of Midland Valley. Delta Tops and Succession Hops, in fact. So I shall hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Tom, uh, let me just close a couple of things. If you keep an eye on the waiting room, Tom, while I'm uh, uh, just introducing Andy. Well, it, it gives me a very great pleasure to introduce, uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, that is um, Andy Mitten. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to say, well, I'm trying to get to uh, my crib sheet here. Um, Andy and I have known each other for, I don't know, five, five years or thereabouts. Uh, and some of you have probably met Andy at uh, Spireslack. Um, it, I think it's particularly appropriate uh, to be able to welcome uh, um, a younger researcher, uh, someone at the start of their research career. Um, and uh, so it's um, uh, very nice to... Uh, have someone uh, talk to us who's really just beginning to branch out in his uh, research expertise. Andy uh, graduated from Keele uh, University in 2015 with a uh, master's in geoscience uh, degree. Um, stayed there to um, start a PhD looking at river systems in the US. Um, somehow that, that PhD branched out to uh, begin to look at river systems in uh, in Scotland and particularly at Spires Light. I, I may have been uh, uh, partly responsible for that and dragging Andy up to Spires Light and say, hey, you must have a look at this stuff. Um, but uh, particularly Andy is looking to uh, ways and means to generate reservoir models. Uh, so to use the observations that he is uh, very adept at making in outcrop and transforming those into uh, reservoir models for the subsurface that uh, it can begin to tell people about the the way that uh, resources, uh, hydrocarbons in the main, but uh, water as well, uh, how they how those would behave in the subsurface. So he's beginning to get on the publishing stream. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> together published uh, uh, on uh, Spire Slack in 2018, and Andy is now uh, lead author in a number of papers. And uh, we'll all have our fingers crossed for him in the uh, first few days of next month when he does his uh, PhD viva. So we look forward to uh, seeing that all successfully completed, Andy. Um, amongst other things, he's uh, uh, won a, an outstanding presentation award from uh, SEPM in 2019 for that <clears throat> work on uh, reservoir models. And so we're uh, very pleased to have Andy here tonight to talk about Delta Tops and Succession Hops. It was quite an intriguing title. So Andy, I'll just hand over to you. Okay, so if I, oh, host, host disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> oh, uh, no. Right, just looking into that, enable screen sharing. It should be, allow participants to share screen. Nope. Oh. Are you trying to tell me something subtly, Tom? Not at all. I've just made you a co-host. That should have worked. Okay. Yeah, I've got it now. Excellent. Yeah, so I'll just minimise everybody. Uh, there we go. That's fine, Andy. That's all very clear. Okay, Brill. So yeah, thanks, Graham. Uh, today I want to talk to you about delta tops and succession hops. Uh, so the cyclic changes that we see in deltaic sedimentation, and what causes them <coughs> in those uh, 
those cyclic those cyclic variations and we're going to concentrate in particular on the Clackmannan group of the Midland Valley in Scotland um like like Graham said it's somewhere that I got uh, pretty much dragged to but uh, I've kind of fallen in love with the site a little bit it's got some fantastic geology and um, I'm going to try and do it just justice today I'd like to thank the people that I work with on this project um, those at the Basin Dynamics Group here at Keele those at the BGS and Billy Andrews at the University of Strathclyde uh, Johnny who's second on this um, actually is punching probably about 60% of the work on this my PhD only forms a very small portion of the story today but he was a master's student at um, Keele University so a lot of the work is has been done off his back so the aims of the talk today are to look at how do sedimentary cycles form, what drives the cyclicity in the Clackmannan group itself, and to raise some questions regarding uh, carboniferous, carboniferous cyclicity and try and just reassess the, the dogma, if you like. So I'm going to do a brief introduction to the Carboniferous of the UK, a brief introduction to cyclicity in deltas, look at the geological setting, look at the limestone coal formation, this unit here, the base of the Namurian, provide a depositional model for it, look at the upper limestone formation, the, the, the stratigraphical unit above it in the Clack, within the Clackmannan group, and then look at the regional correlation of this unit and then discuss what's driving our delta tops and our succession hops. So the Carboniferous of the UK uh, saw three major highs within the UK, the Welsh Bramant High, the Southern Uplands High and the Grampian Highlands. And between the Grampian Highlands and the Southern Uplands is this Midland Valley here in Scotland, where Glasgow is about here. And during the early Numerian, this was completely dominated by what's called cyclothen deposition. And a lot of you might have heard of that term, but we'll come on to it in a bit and I'll explain a bit more about it. But that's what this yellow represents here. And you can see the entirety of the Midland Valley is full of this, uh, this yellow unit. So this is all cyclothen deposition here. The Midland Valley itself is bound by the Southern Uplands Fault and the Highland Boundary Fault, which are probably Caledonian type structures that have lots of phases of deformation running through them. But not to muddy the uh, story too much, we're looking at these yellow units here, this Namurian strata here. And because of the scale of the map, there is a tiny yellow blip just below that S there. And that's where we're gonna sit and talk about today with this S, this is Spires Lac here. This is gonna be our field site. And paleogeographically, we're on the equator on the continental margin of La Russia. So succession hops, kind of the key thing that I want to, you to think about today is these are mainly driven by fluctuations in sea levels. Cyclicity is mainly sea level driven in uh, sedimentology in the most basic principles of it. And this is driven by Milankovitch cyclicity. And these are variations in the Earth's orbit. So they can be the shape of the orbit, for instance, eccentricity, where we're looking at a more circular orbit to a more oval type orbit, the obliquity or tilt. So it, the Earth isn't like that. It's more at 23 degrees and it spins around its axis on that, on that plane. And then precision, which is kind of a wobble, if you like. Uh, if you imagine spinning a coin on the desk when it starts to slow down and go a bit lazy and chaotic, uh, a bit like it before it's had a cup of coffee, that's kind of the precision change to the Earth's orbit and rotation. And they occur at three different scales. So at 21,000 years, 40,000 years, and 95,000 years, approximately. And here's a sea level curve through the Nemurian, where we're seeing the blues, which is sea level rises, and the reds that are sea level falls. But how, do, how does the sea level rise relative to these Milankovitch cycles. So the Milankovitch cycles dictate climate. So when it gets hotter, the polar ice caps that we had during the early Carboniferous melt and that raises the sea level. And likewise, when, they, when you go into ice house conditions, when you're forming these, uh, when you're forming these polar caps, 
sea level falls. And this is going on today, and it's not such uh, good news for Mr. Polar Bear because we're massively increasing these changes. So a change that we would be seeing would be a vertical line here. Um, but, you know, there's, we'll have a reprieve from all that doom and gloom today because there weren't any polar bears to worry about in the early Carboniferous, which is good. And these succession hops are driven by two major components variations in accommodation space and by accommodation space I mean the hole in which sediment is put in the basin um, without a hole there's no way there's no way that you can preserve the sediment and the rate of sedimentation so the speed at which sediment's coming in to fill this accommodation space and accommodation space is driven by these fluctuations in sea level here and also subsidence we can lose accommodation space by uplift and sediment supply is driven mostly by climate which we've said is linked to sea level but also it can be related to uplift as well if there's a if there's if you imagine a uh, an orogeny where you're having a mountain mountain range uplift then you're gen going to generate a lot of sediment that can be eroded and then transported down into the accommodation space so into the basin and this kind of just creates this witch's cauldron um, of sedimentological controls where we're having sea level change and tectonics dictating uh, accommodation space creation and sediment supply and tectonics. Well, I should say climate really, but it's sediment supply really is muddling the pot even further with our controls. And what this witch's cauldron and all these ingredients kind of produce produces this soup of, of uh, geological topics. It's called sequence stratigraphy, where, which is the analysis of uh, sedimentary cycles from a stratigraphic uh, perspective. So we're going to kind of look at the products of this soup uh, today. And I mentioned cyclothems before earlier. A cyclothem is an old mapping term where you map from carbonate unit to carbonate unit. And yes, it, you're mapping cyclicity, but when you do that, you also obscure all manner of sedimentary sins. So today we're going to look at the genetic properties rather than the lithostratigraphical properties of sediments and try and correlate based upon how those sediments have formed. So we have a general shallowing upwards sequence here where we're going from carbonates through into shallow marines into littoral by littoral i mean beach into continental material where we might get uh, fluvial deposition so river deposition but if you look before the carbonate here we've got a large juxtaposition of environments we're going into offshore materials so we've probably experiencing some sort of sea level rise here and if you were to correlate this based on cyclothems, you'd miss that deepening event there. And that's a type of succession hop. So we're going to call our shallowing upward sequences parasequences, and these are separated out by our first type of succession hop, a deepening event. Just to give you a little bit of a cross section of what that would look like, if you imagine you had an ancient sea level here and you were to fill that accommodation space with the sediment that's been uh, inputted into the, into the system, these would generally prograde or outstep out into the basin. So we're going to look at this progradation here. And if you were to put a vertical log going through this here, where you've raised the sea level and again you've infilled, if you were to raise that sea level and have another parasequence unit coming in over the top, you put the log through there, it would look a lot like this, where we're going from carbonates into these shallow marine siltstones here, into shallow marine sands like here, and then up into littoral and continental units like here, deepening event, and then the cycle repeating again. So we can see this general progradation to parasequences, and we can see how they stack on one another. When we throw subsidence into the mix, we end up with a general relative sea level curve that would look something like this, where you're not really seeing too many sea level falls because you've got this substance that's tempering this sea level change. And 
this triangular wedge that I've drawn on here, this is um, a very simplistic view of what sediment accumulation would be doing. So this is the deposited sediment. In here, I've left this blank at this point of sea level rise. Now, there's a few things that go on in there, but for the sake of today, I don't want to muddy the water of the story too much. So we're just going to consider this as a period of what's called sediment bypass, where you're not having no deposition. And the difference between this relative sea level curve and this accumulated sediment is water depth. So when the deepest portions, you're going to get offshore deposition and then tropical carbonate deposition, and then shallow marine deposition, beach deposition in and around zero water depth, and then continental deposition when relative sea level falls below accumulated sediment. And we've spoken about this cauldron, this witch's cauldron of controls that affect our two things, our rate of sediment input and accommodation space. And we've looked at how parasequences form but there are more scales to cycles. We looked at Milankovic cyclicity earlier and we decided that there were three orders to, this, to these fluctuations in our climate. And Barrel, over a century ago, came up with this idea that we're having lots of fluctuations to sediments and lots of fluctuations to uh, our succession hops and at different orders of magnitude. So we might, each one of these little bumps might correspond to a parasequence, but there are overall trends as well that we can see where we're having more sea level rises, this high stand here, this high sea level here, a sea level fall, and then a low stand, a low, a low sea level. So an example of this would be, this is a great example of from the book cliffs in uh, Utah. This is Gray's Canyon specifically, where it's the Meservert Delta from the Cretaceous. And we can see there's lots of different parasequences within here. Maybe this is a parasequence, or maybe it's a smaller order of cyclicity, but we can see these shales to sandstone variations. They're shallowing upwards, where we're going from dominantly shales into dominantly sandstones. We can see that all the way through in each one of these packages. But then we can see there's more siltstones and shales in this unit than there are in this and again than in this and we've got this white unit through here which is actually littoral this is a beach sediment through here and then in the top one we can see we've got one of these beach sediments but it's being down cut by a fluvial system this is a fluvial channel in here so generally throughout the entire thing, we're also prograding. It's not just each one of these cycles, there's progradations happening on several orders. And then this red line that I've drawn in at the top here, that's there for a, for a distinct reason. And that's representing a sea level fall. So we've had this general progradation and then all of a sudden, bam, the sea level falls come in like what barrel was looking at with those larger order cycles. And above that, we've got fluvial deposition where fluvial deposits have prograded rapidly over that time surface, that larger scale succession hop, if you will, and then are graded, they've deposited. So we're gonna look at the mechanics of that and some examples of that out in, out in uh, Scotland now. So just put your eye back in, we're here at Spires Lack. And I just want to bring your attention to this Deckman fault here, this uh, kind of northwest southeast trending fault that was active during the Nemurium that cuts through Glasgow. And just to bring your eye into the stratigraphy again, we've got the, the limestone coal formation, which is going to form the first part of our talk, which is made of, up of uh, siltstones, sandstones and coals. We have the index limestone here that I'm going to use as a dividing marker during the talk. And then the upper limestone formation with the spires lack sandstone, which is going to form another integral part of our talk. This is a high resolution geological map of the area. And we can see that there's lots of faulting and folding going on in these blues. These are the limestone units that Mike and Graham have 
done a fantastic job of correlating. And this paleogene dike that cuts through here, and we're going to see examples of that in the sediments in a moment. But first, I just want to kind of illustrate the more structural aspects of what's going on at the site. And this is a reconstruction of the coals. So this is an open cast unit of the area where they've mined out the coals. And this is just where the coals have been put back in in the computer, just so we can see what the units would have done at surface. So the L coal here is this orange unit on there, and which is this one just below the index limestone. And you can see that there's this very tight folding to the unit and then as you come further towards the southwest there's less folding so as a sedimentologist I'm going to set up shop just about here in this block where I only have to contend with one or two faults and I'm going to leave all the folding and all the fractures and these amazing faulted structures that I, I think you guys did a trip there and uh, Graham will have no doubt talked to you about these structures but I'm going to leave this to Graham and Billy Andrews at Strathclyde University. And if you're interested in the structural aspects of the area and indeed some of the mine collapse, then I'm sure if you badger Graham, then uh, Billy would very much like to give a talk to you guys. So the site itself is made up of the Ponesque site, Grass Hill, this main void that we were just looking at there, and the B1 face, which is my favourite down here. And this is just a digital elevation model showing the different holes, if you like, that we're going to be looking at. And in our, our little field site up here, we have the main void, that one that we saw earlier, and the high wall section here, and the B1 face to the south. What we did was went out into the field and collected an absolute load of photographs with roughly an 85% overlap on each one and collected lots of GPS points and reconstructed these cliff faces in 3D. So that what we can do is we can take them back to, well, it's particularly useful now with, all, with the current situation. And what I can do is I can an, analyze the sedimentary succession back here in the office in, uh, in 3D. So I can take bed thickness measurements, width measurements, I can do surface area estimates of different genetic sedimentary unit and I coupled that with this log through the trench here well Johnny did he coupled that with the log that's through here and you know these techniques are really useful because <laughs> it rains a lot at Spires Lack and it, you know it's quite a lot more comfortable to do it here at home and this is the main void we can see that it's a very large open cast mining where we have an engineered limestone face on the left hand side here and this high wall succession on the right there's a roughly a 40 degree dip to these beds and for scale this is uh, i think mike and graham maybe if not two of them bgs members of staff and we can see these paleogene dikes that cut through the succession but mostly what i want you to look at is the cyclic nature of the sandstones coals shales and siltstones within here and you can see there's three distinct packages. There's this cyclic nature to these siliciclastic sediments. And then you've got these, this index limestone unit here, surrounded by this marine shale, and then the spires lack sandstone here. So there's three different units. And so there's three different, if you like, subsections to this portion of the talk. So the high wall again split into those three sections you've got these this unnamed large limestone uh, sorry sandstone through here this paleogene dike through there some faults and then the spires lack sandstone in here the b1 face for reference at the base of the b1 face down here we have this the index limestone these silts and shales that you can see here this is the shales marine shales surrounding that index limestone, and then we have that spires lack sandstone unit here. This is just where it was taken, it's a little camera position over here. And you can see we have this lake down at the, well, puddle down at the bottom here, and that's sitting directly on top of that index limestone. And then you can see the spires lack sandstone and the rest of the upper 
limestone formation there. And the torque's kind of going to finish at the base of the Lion Cross limestone here because I'm a clastic geologist. And, you know, but we can, we can generally see that we've got a, an overall stratigraphic story running through the field area. Now, this is another big advantage to photogrammetry because in, we collected the data in 2016 when we were running a workshop there. Then, unfortunately, in 2018, we lost the face due to reclamation works with it being an engineered face and it being deemed unsafe to the public. So it's now buried. But luckily, we have this, this three-dimensional record that we can still work on. It's not just for teaching purposes or for posterity. It's, it's, it's also a, uh, an active research, research resource. So the log that I spoke about going up through that trench by the main void, the limestone coal formation is pretty much what that log is made up of. And the log kind of goes up here and then this bit down up there would be that bit down there and then it goes up again and up again up here. But I, I know that you can't see any of that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break that log down and I'm gonna talk you through certain components that are making up the sedimentology of the area. I'm not going to go into it too much or talk about too many of the cycles because, you know, th this talk's probably dull enough. It's going to get, it'll get worse if we, um, if we go into that sort of thing. But the log basically starts down here at the Johnston shale bed and finishes here at the index limestone. We've got the Spires Lack sandstone here, but we're going to come on to that a bit later on. So I'm splitting it up into four power sequences. So I'm going to give the game away right away and say there's four power sequences. And I'm going to go into detail on the first one, but you know, after that kind of that'll that'll do us, we can get away with the rest. So there's mouth bar deposits, there are intertidal flat deposits where we're seeing nice flazar bedding and things like this. And this is uh, what's operating between mean low tide and mean high tide. We have minor distributary channels. So these are little rivers that are just stretching out off the top of our delta. This is our delta top stuff. And then we have overbank sedimentation where we've moved slightly away from these, uh, from these river channels where we're forming coals and lots of bioturbation. And then we have these supratidal flats, which are exposed subaerially most of the time. So they're exposed to the air, they weather, there's a lot of there's a lot of plant activity there that's causing a lot of biogenic weathering. And these tend to form extremely hard paleosols. So these are the kind of the slang mining term for these are sea turfs. Hopefully some of you have heard of that and you can kind of get an idea of what these are. But to put that into context, if we this is just a, a little snippet from the Mississippi Valley, there's a little bit of a mouth bar here. There's that intertidal flat range possibly there. Maybe that's not always submerged. Maybe that's this is just at a higher tide portion. And this image was taken. We have these distributary channels. We have a bit of overbank where we're seeing some uh, some maybe some, fauna, uh, some flora growing and then building up peat mires. And then these supratidal flats where maybe the, the tidal influence isn't quite reaching all that way up onto the delta top. So as I said, there's four power sequences running through here. And, you know, there's these general coarsening upwards trends that we were looking at, these shallowing upwards. Maybe there's some higher resolution ones like what we were seeing down at the base of the of that um, Mesoverd group example from in Utah before. Maybe that's happening again here in power sequence three. But generally what we can see is that in power sequence four, this is when we start to really get our first influx of a really kind of large river system. This is this unit here is over six meters thick. So this is kind of our first really thick portion of river, river systems. And when we consider the proportion of processes that have gone in and contributed to the deposition of these sediments, we can see that trend. So everything that says deep here, so blue, is two 
is you know the water's too deep to tell whether it's tidal or whether it's uh, fluvial so river riverborne deposits or whether it's a tidal deposit or it's a fluvial deposit we can kind of quantify that vertically at the succession and we can see between parasequence one and two there's a large increase in fluvial deposition parasequence three between two and three there's an increase in tidal and then into four that large increase in fluvial again and throughout those four parasequences there is an increase in fluvial deposition so fluvial fasces this genetic deposition of fluvial sediments and we can see that general increase from about 25 percent to 65 percent so maybe we've got one of those we've got our parasequences but then we've got our overall progradation again and that can be seen in the bed thickness data. This is just some of the work that you can do with the photogrammetric reconstructions. And this is pulled straight from Johnny's thesis where we can see these prograding units up through here. Each one of these parasequences has been correlated, but overall we can see the increasing bed thickness. And we can see that there's a, this large, what we called unnamed sandstone before. You know, it, it's pretty much the dominant portion of this parasequence here, whereas before they're a lot more heterolithic. There's a lot more sand, silt and shale in there. So there's three kind of M members to deltas, those dominated by rivers, waves and tides. River dominated ones are like the Mississippi, like what we've just seen, these long finger like deltas. Where uh, we have the wave dominated deltas, these are more winged and quite flat, like the San Francisco one off the coast of Brazil. And then tides, we end up with not so much deltas, but estuaries uh, dominating these successions. Uh, but we end up with lots of little uh, islands that end up building out in a delta type of geometry. And this is just an example, a schematic from the fly delta, well, delta, if you will, from Indonesia. But if we take the, that idea of process and we apply it to this ternary diagram here, where you'd have 100% river dominated uh, processes plotting at the top here, 100% tide plotting down here, and 100% wave plotting over here, our delta of the lower limestone, uh, of, the, of the limestone coal formation, plots about here as a river, river dominated delta. So we're looking at something that's got roughly the plan form geometry of the Mississippi delta it's nowhere near the scale because we're not draining that bigger area but you know it's um it's gonna have the similar shape if not the scale but what i find interesting with our succession hops here if you like we've established at the top we've got this large one that's we we've broken up our succession into the index limestone here and we've got an overall progradation through it here where we're seeing more fluvial and continental material in the or in the yellow and orange here and what we can see is when we look at our parasequences that the parasequence boundaries never really go fully fully marine again apart from possibly at parasequence 2 which was more dominantly tidal than anything else which is also interesting but that's that begs the question if it's a sea level rise you'd expect to see you know marine sediments in there so maybe there's something going on there and then we get this larger sea level rise here for the index limestone and then the spires lack where we can see something entirely different is going on there in the spires lack sandstone when we go up into the upper limestone formation and this is just a plan view schematic if you like that johnny produced of the limestone coal formation so you can see again what our sediments would be looking like so the upper limestone formation at the b1 face again remember this is the spires lack sandstone here we have a fluvial portion to that so we have a river dominated succession here these inclined heterolithic strata here is also within the spires lack sandstone and then a marine upper limestone formation portion above. So we're going to work through this stratigraphically. We're going to concentrate on the fluvial bit. Then we're going to go to the incline bit. And then this bit of a head, what was a bit of a head scratcher for everybody in here. And then finishing with this final marine section here. So 
our fluvial system for the spires lack sandstone can be split into two genetic units one channel set and another so channel set one is quite massive quite homogeneous and we can see it's uh, by homogeneous i mean it's a wall of sand um that's not much it's not very heterolithic and channel set two though has quite a little bit more complexity to it you can just see that but through the way that it's weathered here and again here there's a lot more blocky type of material here rather than it just being one big wall and we can see some inclined strata there so channel set one is forming very simple channel like deposition where we're having bed form uh, deposition in the base of the channel and that's just building up when the channel abandons and then in channel set two we're getting a lot more bar form deposition and that shows up really nicely here in the sedimentary log where at the base we're seeing this, again, this sedimentary log works the same way. You go up the succession like this, and then through here, and then through here. So you see in this massive, kind of slightly cross-bedded sandstone unit, then you're getting these crevasse splay overbanky type things with the coquillard coal in here, which is just there. And then you're getting these smaller, more heterolithic cross-bedded you know, sandstones that are forming these bar forms. So a quick schematic of those. This is what one of the river channels would look like with the bed forms migrating down there. You know, quite classic fluvial deposition. Then some crevasse splays with peat mires forming and maybe some standing water aiding the formation of this coquillard coal. And then some bar form deposition where we're getting quite complex interactions between bar, uh, bed forms that are building up and forming a lot like the mid-channel bars that you see in a lot of river systems in the modern day. But now I want to focus in on this kind of inclined heterolithic unit here. And what you can see is that these beds form kind of S shapes, like really stretched out S shapes. And each one of these is kind of filled with these these burrows here that are saline burrows so they're deposited in saline conditions and they've got a distinct orientation to them which means there is a significant flow operating in the area and these are tidal these are tidal burrows and so we think this was a tidally influenced point bar you know they're all influenced in one way but there's these tidal couplets that you see in the actual bedding you're actually getting sandstone siltstone sandstone siltstone much like what we saw in that intertidal zone before in uh, the limestone coal formation and again into the head scratcher unit now so that's separated out here and this photo is taken just from in here we where we have couplets of sandstone and shale and you know no one really was kind of get into grips with what this was till Johnny d went away and did a really good literature review and came up with this example where it's this is from the states as well this is from the Neslam formation uh some work by Ronald Steele where we're seeing kind of cup shaped to circular channel fills of sandstone and siltstone couplets and there's a nice example of that in here so that looks pretty similar where we've got this tidal influence producing these couplets, but we're in this nice channel shape. And this is, these are estuary deposits. So we, we've kind of trans, transitioned from a really active river system depositing really coarse sediment. And then, you know, we've had a bit of a period of quiescence where we've had some crevasse splay deposition and coal buildup and then we've had a bar form buildup where we're getting a a bit more of a traditional sedimentology to a river system and then a tidal point bar deposit through into an estuary and as we said before when we were looking at the fly on that ternary diagram that estuaries are dominantly tidal so maybe we're seeing some sort of overall change here but that overall change is kind of finished off by this marine portion with the lion cross limestone in here which might be marine i mean um it it looks marine 
but um, we don't know for sure because the face is gone and we could never access that portion of the face. But, you know, the, the overall pattern here is completely vice versa to what we were seeing before. So we thought we'd try and correlate this. And if anybody's tried correlating with uh, borehole records, I mean, I was very lucky. I had these lovely graphic representations of the log to deal with, but it can be very difficult to correlate coals and limestones through these units. Now, this is our map of our boreholes that we've used. So this is our study site. This is the cross section that we're going to be looking at here, which is kind of a strike section through uh, the regional paleo current. And we've got the A70 wiggling its way through our map here, down to Muirkirk here, and Douglas is up here. And to kind of give reference to our, to our section, we're using the index limestone like we have done for the entire talk. That's what's going to divide up our section. And that's what's providing our flat surface that we can then orientate all the boreholes against. And what we can see in the lower section is that limestone coal group where we've got these black metals. So the Johnst that Johnston shell bed would be about down here on all of these. And we can see some small distributary channels cross-cutting coals and forming this kind of parasequence stacking relationship in there. And then you have this index limestone and associated shale succession. But what we don't see, certainly in the models that we've been, the 3D renderings that we've been looking at today, is this birch law limestone. And that is that does outcrop in the spires lack this SGP spires lack site that we've been looking at, but it's just not shown up in our in in that main void or on the b1 face so we've i'm kind of leaving that as it is and just focusing on the field site but just to show you that it, it is there but this spires lack sandstone well more importantly the surface at the base of the spires lack sandstone has actually cut down and eroded that away in our field site and we can trace the two channel sets and the inter interfingering coquyard coal And the general thickness of this spires lack sandstone changes as we look across our transect. And we can see from this, this is just a thickness map here where the lightest colors are the thinnest and the darkest colors are the thickest. And we can see it gets to about 16 meters in and around the Douglas area here in the Douglas one borehole. And that kind of general trend that's kind of running through here is in line with that active Deckman fault running through Glasgow. So maybe that's playing a role in controlling our sedimentation of the spires lack sandstone, and actually the distribution of those sediments. So to build up a depositional model for the overall area, not just the upper limestone formation, we have our parasequence buildup that is forming our general progradation through the limestone coal formation, where we're seeing these deepening events that we are looking at down at the left, or bottom left here, we've got, I'm not an artist, I'm sorry, but this is a very badly drawn sea level curve where we can see these little steps like what we were looking at before. And then we have our index limestone where maybe we've got a large transgression. The index limestone incidentally would be this unit here in this 3D block. And I've just drawn a general parasequence above that that shows um, and that, I'm just accounting that as the birch law line, uh, as the birch law package that's in here. Now, the base of this spires lack sandstone is erosional, as we've seen from our borehole correlations. And that is our general shape that we're forming. So, as we've dropped our potential sea level here, forming that larger scale succession hop this, uh, that's branched out from the overall progradation. We've seen this incision, and then maybe as sea level's falling faster, that incision's that bit quicker as the river system is trying to deposit down where the accommodation space is, down where the river, where the, where the sea is. But because you've dropped it, it's moved away from where the delta was previously. And then it's eroded down into this 
birch law limestone kind of perisequency unit in here that's not being correlated in what we've been seeing today. And then we have the basal portion of the Spires Lack sandstone, so those, those river channels that are being deposited maybe at the base of our subsequent sea level rise or transgression. And then we're coming up into our tidal point bar and through into the Coquille Coal and these areas. And then finally, this, the rest of this valley would have been filled with that estuarine fill that we were looking at before. So our valley, our incised valley, becomes an estuary. So what drives our succession hops and our delta tops? Is it just sea level change? The answer is most probably yes and no, but I'm just going to throw my hands out and say, here's what I think is going on. And it's completely interpretive, really. Um, there's a lot of work yet to be done to prove this. But what I would say is that river avulsions are the main cause of our parasequence buildup. If you remember at the start, I said that accommodation space and sediment supply are what drive cyclicity. So if you change sediment supply and leave accommodation space kind of, kind of static, that should, in theory, drive these parasequences, drive succession hops and create what look like deepening events. But maybe they're just where the river is vaulted away from where we're seeing and we're seeing a period of sediment bypass this area of non deposition that would look like a flooding surface and then when the sed the locus of sedimentation has come back that's when the next parasequences build up the only one i'm iffy about on that because we are seeing some marine deposits and we have that increased tidal portion is in parasequence two where maybe we were seeing this minor sea level rise that's forming at the top of power sequence two there. That's maybe what's driving that particular succession hop. But then after our overall progradation through the limestone coal formation here up to time surface four, maybe we're seeing a substantial sea level rise here where the index limestone is being deposited and we're getting those marine shales. That's probably more likely in this scenario that our parasequence boundaries are being built up by river avulsions, but our larger succession hops, our larger magnitude sea, what look like sea level changes, are driven by sea level. So maybe the small scale sediment supply and the large scale is changes in accommodation space creation. And then a major sea level fall at the base of the Spires Lack Sandstone and a transgression to a rising sea level forming those estuary deposits above. So again, we can see that this, this soup that we've made in our cauldron, in our witch's cauldron of controls is, is very complex. And it all boils down to what's in there. So if, you're, if your basin hasn't got an ocean, hasn't got any sea in there, then sea level change can't be playing a part, but climate can. So then you'd be left with sediment supply and tectonics. If you know you're in a tectonically quiescent basin, so there's no tectonic activity within that basin, then you're pretty much relying upon sediment supply and, and sea level change. But as we said, sediment supply is dictated by climate, and so is sea level. So maybe that's a lot easier. But however, we're dealing with the Carboniferous of the UK, and we've got all three of these things going on. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's mad to try and distill it, as you hopefully you've, you've seen from my attempt at some sort of explanation. So it boils down to how many controls are there on the, how many controls are there on that system? What's the most dominant control on that system? Is it river avulsion? I think in this case, yes, because we're dealing with a river dominated delta. Is it sediment supply change? It could well be. I mean, we, we're looking at active tectonism in the area where we could be having an uplift. We've seen that the Deckman Fault is potentially playing a control. So I think it's possibly a, a complex mix between river avulsion and sediment supply change through tectonics that's actually driving these control, that's driving these sedimentary succession hops and these delta tops that we're seeing. And then finally, is it sea level? And kind of the dogmatic stigma that has been through sedimentology 
um, particularly within the Carboniferous, is that perisequences and cyclothems are driven by sea level change. And kind of what I want you to take away from this is don't believe that dogma. If somebody says to you and they're so fervently stuck in their ways that it, it must be sea level change, ask for a bit of evidence. And yeah, for sure it could be. But, you know, there's a lot more complexity there that, that preconceived ideas aren't quite taking hold of so there's a few things that this is bringing out that's challenging the norm which is quite nice but at the same time again at the moment i have no proof so the kind of the the next thing to do would be to model these successions so we take our nice little individual power sequence models and those of barrel from nine from over a century ago and we combine them and we try to replicate the sedimentary succession at spires lack so I'd just like to leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, thanks once again to all those that have helped me with the project. And uh, has anybody got any questions? You're muted still, Graham. Um, I've got a question. Hi, uh, Hi. Um, is this likely go for it, Jane? Thank you. Um, is this likely to be similar across the whole of the Carboniferous, <laughs> or will it very much depend, as you've said, how close you actually are to an ocean? Yeah. So there's uh, one, th one thing that I've I've kind of tried to keep the story kind of simple, but also to raise a few questions. There is a huge space aspect to these cycles. So these you could get a what are essentially parasequence type cycles with very little in the way of any marine influence at all. And that might just be that you are closer towards the land than you are the sea. But there's, you know, we are seeing some marine influences there. And so maybe there is some larger sea level rises than other ones, and maybe sediment supply is playing a control. But yeah, there's definitely, I would say it depends where you are in your delta and where you are in your, your paleogeography, to be honest, to what's uh, really controlling it. But I just wanted to provide an example of just, you know, some of the questions that we can raise about the norm. Thank you. It's okay. I'm coming from the Carboniferous near your neck of the woods. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Who's next? Who, who? Any more questions? Um, I'm Simon. Simon. Simon Price. Hand up, and so is and so is Bill. Yep. Simon first, and then we'll go to Bill. Uh, Simon, you should be able to unmute. <clears throat> should be able to unmute yourself. Um, is that okay? Yep. <clears throat> yep. You're good. Thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed that talk. I'm looking forward to my first opportunity to challenge the dogma. I quite like quite like <laughs> finishing on that. Um, I guess I, I was just interested in some of the evidence that you might look for for things like river revulsion. So looking at tectonics, what what are the other kinds of pieces of evidence that you might pull together from from the area, either of work that you've done or from the literature that might help you um, give you some more clues for that? So there's um... There's, lot, there's a, a lot of things that you can do to look at river revulsion in particular, and it's all to do with reconstructing the, the dynamics of the river itself. Mm -hmm. So not just how it deposited, but how it flowed. And if we consider things like cross bed thicknesses, so the set thicknesses that are formed from cross beds, mm -hmm. then you can estimate a water depth. And then from that, you can look at fluctuations in it and when it was more you know consistent and when it was more variable and maybe you can look at where sand's not quite filled the channels and where you've had plugs and that means there's been rapid avulsions where it's mm -hmm. just filled up with flooded material but also there's things like looking at the difference between what are aggradational bed forms within a channel so when when bed forms stack within the actual channel form itself and actually the rate of its lateral migration Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of build up a little bit of a story that way and if if things are generally stacking quicker than they're moving sideways you know then maybe you're getting quite a lot of what what we call compensational stacking 
rather than just a nice meandering system. So there's things like that that we can do to incorporate into the story and we can get all this from our 3D photogrammetric models mm. and we can use that and build that into our, our overall interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's new to me, but thank you for that. That's all right, thanks Simon. Thanks Simon. Um, now, where, where's Bill gone? Bill, I think was, uh, had a question? Um, Andrew Graham knows I'm not a geologist, but so let's tell you that I'm not a geologist. <laughs> But Colin Ballantyne says that in Scotland, most of the sediments that have come off Scotland and are dumped either in, on land or offshore are really at the deglaciation. You know, they're 10, 12,000 years old. Mm. In other words, they're quite punctuated not only by the weather, but suddenly at, at these weather changes. Have you, any, have you any thoughts about that or any indication of that in, in your work? Um, to be honest, the, uh, the kind of the... Are you talking about um, very modern drainage from Scotland? Well, well, Colin Ballantyne is obviously in the last two glaciations or so, and 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 he says that all the all this debris which is lying about Scotland was actually was actually dropped in a, in a very short period of time mm. after, at the deglaciation at the last deglaciation. De, deglaciation. Yeah. Yes. Um, these deglaciations and things like this, you, you're going to get different sediment deposits no matter where you are in the world so Scotland was glaciated and you've seen the equivalent of a succession hop if you like you've seen the the equivalent of uh, a dumping of sediment or a period of bypass and erosion of sediment where you have high and low sea levels relative to the glaciers that are around so what you're what you're talking about there is essentially one of the succession hops that we've been looking at today but we're looking at it from the carboniferous perspective and we're because we're on the equator we're looking at it from nowhere near a glacier if you like so there's no glaciers actually affected the time that our delta was deposited but the melting of those glaciers and the formation of glaciers at the time due to these Milankovitch cycles has created cyclic patterns the world over. I mean, the Carboniferous throughout the world is associated with these cyclic patterns. And you, that you can, um, you're essentially describing a succession hop. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that all climate change that we're experiencing at the moment is just a power sequence boundary and we don't need to worry because it's, <laughs> it's not, we're having quite adverse effect ourselves, but, um, but you know, the, the, there is the succession hops through both the what we call the modern quaternary environment and in the ancient rock record. Right, thank you. Oh, thanks very much, David. Who's who's next? Bill. Here we go. Hi, Hiya, Phil. Hi, that was really good. Thanks. <laughs> really interesting. Can I can I take you back to the the very start of your talk, and, and in fact, the start of, of, of our relationship, which was in, in Utah, and you, you showed a, a nice big channel sand cutting down into, into your Paris sequences. Yeah, yeah. Is that uh, avulsion controlled and tectonically controlled as well? Like, like you it, seem to think the spires lack is, and the, the corollary to that question then is, having looked a lot at, at Utah, as I know you have, uh, are you coming to the conclusion maybe that a lot of the, the sequence boundaries in Utah are tectonically controlled rather than sea level controlled? Uh, thanks, Phil. This is recorded. Um, this is, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so F Phil actually is the one that, uh, with association with Stu, my PhD supervisor, is one of these people that took me out to Utah and introduced me to the fluvial systems out there. But um, yeah, that 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 unit that was above that sea level fall, that's that's the lower Castle Gate, and I would suggest, based upon subsidence rates in that kind of region, because it's a foreland basin, you've got very low subsidence rates in that region around Grays Canyon that you're ending up with kind of like a tectonically succession, if you like, and the, the down cuttings are more pronounced and these juxtapositions of delta top to deltaic sediments with what is quite coarse braided material is actually more significant in that region, the way it's preserving than it is maybe further towards the mountain belt. So I would say yes, in answer to your question, 
but also based upon my answer to Simon's question earlier, but that I have done some work like that out in Utah on the sediments out there and looked at reconstructing the sinuosities of the river systems and things like this. And I would very much think that that is more tectonically and sediment supply driven based upon the fact that that orogenic portion there is very active during the time of that fluvial system's deposition. Okay, that's, that's great, thanks. I'm just glad to see that we, we both disagree with President Trump. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind that bit re-recorded. <laughs> Keep the dogma, shall we? <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Um, sort of just unmute yourselves and uh, fire away uh, if there are any other questions. Andy, can I ask one? Uh, I'll ask. Oh, who was that? That was that, was, that was me, but. No, good. It's all right. You go I, first, Graham. Great, great. Yeah, um, I, well, just just quickly, Andy. Um, you've um, given us a very good impression of how of the continuity of this succession. So you can build one power sequence on top of another. You can see a a, 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 <clears throat> a very uh, pronounced sea level change. Uh, incoming and marine uh, sediments with the, the index and then a, a sudden drop again. So it, it's kind of all there. So there's part of me wondering how many gaps are there actually in this succession? Or do you think this, are, are there intervals where there's nothing happening, Andy, and no accumulation? Um, and in a sense, those are hidden from us. Uh, almost because of how continuous this sequence appears to be, <clears throat> would you expect to them? Would you expect there to be some significant pauses where just no accumulation occurs at all? Um, I suppose that we need to start by taking a step back with this answer. That the, every when I when I say succession hop today, we've been talking about power sequences and you know higher orders of magnitude of cyclicity, but any kind of fabric within a sedimentary rock is a succession hop in a way every every cross bed is so mm -hmm. whenever you see a cross bed that is a there's a period of little bit of bypass in there yeah. so there's all sorts of scales within the sedimentary record but particularly here when we're looking at these periods of bypass at our succession hops at the parasequence scale we're i'm fairly sure that the river systems are probably still draining we're just not seeing them drain because if you think about it we're looking at one slice one block from this delta but there's nothing to stop a river say this is our, our field of view is like is like this maybe our river's just over here yeah, yeah. and we're not seeing the products of that so maybe it's just a period of bypass and not a period of non-deep position if yeah, you like yeah Okay. relative to our location, if you see what I mean. Yeah, good answer. Thank you. Um, now, Tom, I think you were next. Or is there anybody else uh, want to jump in in front of Tom? Yeah, I, I'll... Carry on. What I was going to say is actually, I, I might spin and my, my question in at the end with the boat of tanks, if, if that's possible. <laughs> so if there's anybody anybody else no, who would like to is there anybody else from the floor, floor, from isn't? the screen i should say rather than from the floor but uh, are there any other hands up it seems not last chance anyone okay tom i'll hand hand the show back to you in that case Thank you, Andy. Thanks very much. Right. Cheers, Graham. Okay. Well, okay, Andy. Uh, first of all, obviously, thank you. Thank you for um, giving us a, a really comprehensive introduction into sequence stratigraphy, actually, which uh, I remember as an undergraduate thinking, what, what, what are these power sequences, et cetera, et cetera. So you've really clearly, clearly uh, described those and shown what they look like in the field as well and uh, for all of those who haven't had the chance to go to spies slack i suggest you you pester graham to uh take you there and show you the site because it is 
really, really spectacular. And uh, having been there myself, but in a different capacity than what Andrew, Andy was there for, it's uh, really, really great to be able to see some of the work, some of the, the sedimentological work that's been done there. Um, now, I was thinking, my, my question, I'm going to pose it to you now, Andy, if that's all right, was you have introduced us there to a fantastic model for deposition of the new mirror, mirror the, the limestone coal in the Midland Valley. And uh, that's, I, I think it's good, whether avulsion or this, that, or the other. Um, the question I think now is, how do you test that? How do you test your model? Yeah. And I've got sitting here on my other screen, I've got the, the, the British Geological Survey Geo Index onshore map, interactive map, and I'm looking at where all the other boreholes are for the, the limestone coal formation. And I, I would have thought, do you think that by looking at other boreholes throughout the limestone coal of the Midland Valley, you'd be able to get an idea of whether or not your model holds? I mean, unfortunately, we don't have many of the, the uh, old coal faces exposed, but it would appear that there don't actually seem to be too many. So no, the, can, could, you, could you answer that before I continue with my question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, first off, just thank you very much for the opportunity to come to present to you today. It's been, I've, I've enjoyed it. It's been good. And it's been good revision for my chapter four. Uh, <laughs> so that's been good. But um, in answer to your question, it, it'd be, it'd be difficult. Yes and no is the answer, really, much like I've sticking with my theme for today. Um, so there's very limited paleontological <laughs> control on the and things like this and to kind of to try and correlate time through these successions is is difficult because it, eventually it becomes a spatial problem. Time time prefers, preserves in space with a river revulsion. So it's from there to there. So with the very limited borehole record that there is for this stuff, in particularly in and around Spires Lack, the, um, it is very difficult. Um, and maybe it can help provide some validation. But what I'm going to try and do, and hopefully make it robust enough for, um, certainly for uh, to, to test this model and indeed other other stratigraphic models based upon sedimentary logs is I'm going to try and kind of inverse model it, if you like, try and get the sea level and associated water depths from our, from our witch's cauldron and our sequence stratigraphic soup to develop a, um, to develop the sedimentary succession, to reproduce it digitally. Uh, and then test it that way. And then we can look at what's most probable by playing around with a whole host of factors. We can, but when we play around with the inputs, we can look at the probability of our models being correct rather than simply making wild assumptions. Mm. A bit like what I've done today. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Andy. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, thanks. I, I think that's a really good answer as well. And it also highlights the, the direction that sedimentology is going in these days, going from uh, this kind of field data into the statistical statistical sort of areas of trying to predict what will happen spatially. And I, I noticed on your, your bio that you're quite into geostatistics to a certain extent. Is that correct? Uh, unfortunately, yeah, but I, I, I don't think they can stand on their own. I think they've got to work in conjunction with the actual sedimentary analysis, the observations made in the field, in the core. Absolutely. And uh... Great. Well, I mean, I, I, this is what I love about so many of our talks, and you've really highlighted it, uh, the interaction between, between field data and then taking that to the you know, theoretical side. And as we just mentioned, you you have plans to take it even further. And that's um, really, really encouraging. It highlights what work there still is to be done in, in our glorious Midland Valley and the Carboniferous. It's been <laughs> studied for hundreds of years, yet yeah, there's still fantastic questions to answer, which is always, always reassuring. Um, and uh, finally, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank you for what you presented to us and all the best in your Viva, which you say is next week. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I think the society would like to wish you all the best, all the very best for that, Andy. Um, I'm sure it will go very well. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing the news.
Yeah, that's uh, fingers crossed, hey? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed. Virtual clapping there. <laughs> yeah. Do that as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Andy. That was great. Stay on for a wee bit longer if people want to chat or... Um... So... Yeah, if anybody would like uh, to stay in chat. The uh, uh, thank you very much, Andy. I shall stop recording. It's hard to decide. It's like that.